Sir, two camps championing two distinct criminal law philosophies are polarized over whether to retain or repeal 377A, which criminalizes public or private acts of gross indecency between two men, such as sodomy. The liberal camp wants 377A repealed. They offer an argument from consent. Government should not police the private sexual behavior of consenting adults. They opine this violates their liberty or privacy. They ask, why criminalize something which does not harm anyone? If homosexuals are born that way, isn't it unkind to discriminate against their sexual practices? These flawed arguments are marinated with distracting fallacies which obscure what is at stake. Repeating 377A is the first step of a radical political agenda which will subvert social morality, the common good, and undermine our liberties. The communitarian camp argues from community values. The social conservatives 1377A retained to protect public health, morality, decency, and order. A Keep 377A online petition attracted over 15,000 signatures after a few days. Like many, I applaud the government's wisdom in keeping 377A, which conserves but upholds the national interests. Conservative here is not a dirty word, connoting backwardness. Environmental conservation protects our habitat. The moral ecology must be conserved to protect what is precious and sustains a dynamic, free and good society. The welfare of future generations depends on basing law on sound public philosophy. We should reject the argument from consent, as its philosophy is intellectually deficient and morally bankrupt. Sir, the arguments to retain 377A are overwhelmingly compelling and should be fully articulated so legislators can make informed decisions and not be bewitched by the empty rhetoric and emotional sloganeering employed by many radical liberals which generate more heat than light. The real question today is not if we should repeal 377A now or wait until people are ready to move. This assumes too much, as though we need an adjustment period before the inevitable. The real issue is not if, but should we ever repeal 377A. It is not inevitable, it is not desirable to repeal it in any event. Not only is retaining 377A sound public policy, it is legally and constitutionally beyond reproach. Responsible legislators must grapple with the facts, figures and principles involved. They cannot discount the noxious social consequences of repeal. Now, debate must be based on substance and not sound bites. Let me red flag four red herrings. First, to say a law is archaic is merely chronological snobbery. Second, you cannot say a law is regressive unless you first identify your ultimate goal. If we seek to ape the sexual libertine ethos of the wild, wild west, then repeating 377A is progressive. But that is not our final destination. The onus is on those seeking repeal to prove this will not harm society. Third, to say a law which criminalizes homosexual acts because many find it offensive is merely imposing a prejudice or bias boldly assumes no reasonable contrary view exists. This evades debate. The liberal argument which says sodomy is a personal choice, private matter and victimless crime merely asserts this. It rests precariously on an idiosyncratic notion of harm. But harm can be both physical and intangible. Victims include both the immediate parties and third parties. What is done in private can have public repercussions. Fourth, legislators are urged to be open-minded and decriminalize sodomy. However, like an open mouth, an open mind must eventually close on something solid. Legislators are urged to be objective and to leave their personal subjective beliefs at home, especially if they hold religious views that homosexuality is aberrant. This demand for object objectivity is intellectually disingenuous, as there is no neutral ground, no Switzerland of ambivalence when we consider the moral issues related to 377A, which requires moral judgment of what is right and wrong. Not to take a stand is to take a stand. As all law has a moral basis, we must consider which morality to legislate. Neither the majority or minority is always right. 
But there are fundamental values beyond fashion and politics which serve the common good. Religious views are part of our common morality. We separate religion from politics, but not religion from public policy. That would be undemocratic. All citizens may propose views in public debate, whether influenced by religious or secular convictions or both. Only the government can impose a view by law. By the way, one does not have to be religious to consider homosexuality contrary to biological design and immoral. Secular philosopher Immanuel Kant considered homosexuality immoral acts against our animal nature, which did not preserve the species and dishonoured humanity. The issues surrounding 377A are about morality, not modernity or being cosmopolitan. What will foreigners think if you retain 377A? Depends on which foreigner you ask. Many would applaud us. Such issues divide other societies as well. A group of Canadians were grieved enough to issue an online apology to the world for harms done through Canada's legalization of homosexual marriage, urging us not to repeat the mistakes. These debates are not closed locally or globally. Singapore is an independent state. We can decide our own laws. We have no need of foreign or neo-colonial moral imperialism in matters of fundamental morality. Sir, there are no constitutional objections to retaining 377A while decriminalizing heterosexual, oral and anal sex. Three legal points are worth making. First, there is no constitutional right to homosexual sodomy. It is not a facet of personal liberty under Article 9. Nor is there a human right to homosexual sodomy, though some like to slip this in under the umbrella of privacy. Human rights are universal, like prohibitions against genocide. Demands for homosexual rights are the political claims of a narrow interest group masquerading as legal entitlements. Homosexual activists often try to infiltrate and hijack human rights initiatives to serve their political agenda, discrediting an otherwise noble cause to protect the weak and poor. You cannot make a human wrong a human right. Second, while homosexuals are a numerical minority as a social fact, there is at law no such thing as sexual minority. Activists have coined this term to draw a beguiling but fallacious association between homosexuals and legally recognized minorities like racial groups. Race is a fixed trait. It remains controversial whether homosexual orientation is genetic or environmental, perhaps both. There are no ex-blacks, but there are ex-gays. The analogy between race and sexual orientation or preferred sexual preferences is false. Activists repeat the slogan, sexual minority ad nauseum, as a deceptive political ploy to get sympathy from people who don't think through issues carefully. Repetition does not cure fallacy. Science has become so politicized that the issue of whether gays are born that way depends on which scientist you ask. You cannot base sound public philosophy on poor politicized pseudo-science. Homosexuality is a gender identity disorder. There are numerous examples of former homosexuals successfully dealing with this. They claim a right of sexual reorientation. Just this year, two high-profile U.S. activists left the homosexual lifestyle. The publisher of Venus, a lesbian magazine, and an editor of Young Gay America. Their, st their stories are available online. An article by an ex-gay in the New Statesman this July identified the roots of his emotional hurts, like a distant father, overbearing mother, and sexual abuse by a family friend. After working through his pain, his unwanted same-sex attraction left. While difficult, change is possible, and a compassionate society would help those wanting to fulfill the heterosexual potential. There is hope. Singapore law only recognizes racial and religious minorities. Special protection is reserved for the poor and disadvantaged. The average homosexual person in Singapore is well-educated, with higher income. That's why upscale condo uh, developers target them. Homosexuals do not deserve special rights, just the rights we all have. Sexual minorities and sexual orientation are vague terms covering anything from homosexuality, bestiality, incest, pedophilia. Do all these minority sexual practices merit protection?